Hey, great to have you all here today. If you're visiting, uh, my name is Jody May, and I am the uh, teaching pastor here at Highlands. Great to have you here. If you've got any questions, uh, just please see me afterwards. Um, and uh, let's go ahead and get started. If you have your Bibles this morning, go ahead and open up to Luke chapter 2. Excuse me, Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible uh, this morning, um, you can always grab one from our tables out there. And if you don't have one, please take it home. Well, let's see what kind of note we had here this morning. Uh, Oh, nothing good. And uh, so that's our gift to you. Um, if you are visiting or if you've not been here in a while, we are continuing on in a series that we started five weeks ago on the Gospel of Luke. And we are going to be in the Gospel of Luke till I don't know when. So we're just going to go through Luke. We're going to take our time. We're going to open up Luke's message to us, his gospel, his good news to us. And that was so that we may be sure of what we've been taught to believe because Luke is building a case for us for the gospel, by eyewitness account, he tells Theophilus in chapter 1. So these are things that he, people he talked to that actually saw Jesus, saw the people involved in Jesus' life and ministry, and he's giving an account of it like an historian. So we are looking at that perspective today. And today is, a, uh, is going to be actually be, re- well, hopefully, hopefully it's all good, but we're going to be looking at something a little bit special today. It's in uh, Christian history. But without further ado, I'm going to get ahead and read this morning, and then we'll pray, and we'll jump right into our, t- our sermon this morning. Um, let's go ahead and open chapter 1, beginning in verse 39. Verse 39. And it says, In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry. Here's where we start today. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Now this is a a very famous passage today as we begin reading here in verse 46. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. And he has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy." As he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. This is God's word. Let us pray. Father, we ask that this morning, in the preaching of your word, above all, that you would be glorified. That your son would be glorified. That the Holy Spirit that you would send to us, Lord Jesus, to open up our eyes to see and our ears to hear the truth of your word. That as we look at these two ladies' songs of him and praise God, that we would learn from that, why are, we, why are we to be thankful, Father? So that when we as a corporate body sing, and not just sing, but all of life is worship, that when we live, God, it is to be done from a heart that has been touched by you. For you don't take worthless praise or offerings, God. They mean nothing to you. So, Lord, unless you change our hearts, we can't do this. We are right now, dear Lord, so dependent upon you for this. We are caught in the conviction of the gospel that we need to give you worthy praise, but we're also caught in the inability to do it unless you change us. So be our Savior today, Lord. And come grant us this gift of a changed heart, a heart that glorifies you by the affection pouring out of our souls for you, God. And let us respond to that as a corporate people, seeing you clearly. For we love you. And we pray that in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. This is our heart's desire today. Before we get going, though, one more thing I do want to say. I I want to, again, 
Um, I want to extend a thank you to this body of believers on behalf of the Chambers and his family yesterday in hosting a, um, a time of remembrance from Jared's father, Mark, that passed away this past week. Uh, to my family here who came out from putting pine straw down to parking cars, preparing food, to cleaning the building, to cleaning up afterwards. Great job, guys. I'm very proud of you. Thank you for loving them. That is the body of Christ at work. And I know that the family's appreciative of that. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for that. So without further ado, let me go ahead and give some introduction here to what we're going to be talking about this morning. The gospel is the story of God's redeeming work. We've talked about that so far in the book of Luke. And right up front in the Gospel of Luke, we are introduced to a family that's in the line of David. The girls are as well. And that will play a major role in this story that Luke is telling. The Gospel, when people begin to see it as the Spirit quickens them to or makes them alive, can be scary up front. Do you remember when we said that? Because God asks you to do some bold things. Leave the world behind and what? Follow me. That can be scary. This Gospel has leapt into two different lives, literally, both of these ladies, and both of them, it has changed their lives as they've known it because it caused both of them to become pregnant. Actual good news of God. One pregnancy would remove disgrace from a woman and in turn give her a son that would begin the greatest prophetic work since Moses, preparing the way for the Messiah. That would be John the Baptist from Elizabeth. We'll hear her song today in a moment. The other woman, just a young girl, without ever praying for this blessing, was shown favor by God and was chosen to bear a child while being a virgin, giving birth to the divine being, God in flesh, the Messiah. That was Mary. Both got more than what they were looking for in life, and both in today's scripture are demonstrating to us what it looks like when people become aware to the glorious inheritance we receive from God by grace alone. You will see today in Luke's writing, the ladies gave an account to Luke how they responded to God when they received this gospel and were blessed by faith. This is what you're watching today. We are beginning, as it looks like here, in Luke, a little mini-series, what I want to call Reasons for Praise. I'm not going to change any of the logos. I'm not going to change the, the slides. But I want you to stick this in your mind as you start to hear these things for the next few weeks I'm going to be calling these things the reason for our praise, right? We will, over the next few weeks, encounter five different songs or hymns in the book of Luke that were very important to the early Christian church. These hymns come from different people that have different reasons to praise God. That's okay, right? We all see God, His works, but we respond in different ways. Just so you know, these are coming from, we'll look at both Elizabeth's and Mary's songs today, the two ladies involved in our story. And coming down the road, we're going to witness Zechariah's song, Elizabeth's husband. That's coming in two weeks. And then in chapter 2, we're going to actually see a song by people that we couldn't know, the angels. You're going to see their song and why did they respond to God in a certain way. And last one, is a great one, is we're going to see a song of an old man named Simeon. When at long last, he received the reward of laying his eyes on Jesus before he died. That's a good one. So while we're all talking about it, though, let me give you a working definition of praise that I think may help you, especially while you're going through these hymns. Now, in your note sheets, if you are visiting, have been here a while, I do like to give you notes, but I don't do the whole fill in the blank thing because I would rather you pay attention to what I'm saying instead of trying to catch the blank. So in your note sheet today, like this, on here, I have that working definition of praise, and this is what it is today, is that praise is a subjective interaction with the objective work of God. Just chew on that for a minute. The subjective interaction, how you perceive the objective work of God, what He does. All right? That's where praise comes from. I also want to say up front that praise is more than just singing. Someone say amen. <laughs> it's, the, it's like all of life is worship and praise, right? It's, it's how we do that. It's the declaration of joy about God in whatever way you can, in all of life, right? Giving Him glory. But let me talk just about singing for a moment, though. I, I know some of you don't necessarily like to sing in here. I get that, but I'm praying that you receive enough affection for God to make you one day, because I believe that in God. You remember this lesson that makes the impossible what? Possible. That's a working miracle in your life, by the way. If you don't like to sing, you start singing in church one day, that's a miracle. 
I know that you're built a certain way. But also, please understand that for those of you that like to sing in here, that doesn't make you holier than people that don't. Someone say amen. All right, so that's, that's just the truth. Music is a universal gift. You don't even have to be a Christian to like singing. You can come to church, be totally lost, and enjoy the songs, right? I used to work at a church that we, we, we built on that to get people to kind of sing along with us. So, but again, my prayer today is that all of our people in here can find ways to praise God together. And listen to this next statement. Because your hearts have been changed by God. That's why we praise let me say that phrase again because that is the only way any of us can actually praise God the right way. And that is if our hearts have been changed by God. God is not interested in your praise if it does not come from a sincere heart. Let me fill you in on something. In Isaiah, just one place, one, as the prophet Isaiah is proclaiming to his people who've been rebellious for a very long time, who still went through the motions of religion, were trying to offer things to God, their praise and their worship to get God on their side, and listen to God's word, rams of the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of the lambs or of the goats. All the things that you could offer me that you think are making me like you better. Worthless. Bring no more vain offerings, he says. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations, all the holidays that you like to do. I cannot endure, what's that word? Iniquity, sin, and the solemn assembly, the heart that is not changed. God desires praise that comes from a repentant heart, a heart that's turned back to Him, a heart that's seen that He is good, a heart that discovered its need for Him, a heart that knows that God loved first, even while we were what? Still sinners. So here's the main point, though, of the message today. Is that true worship comes from the heart touched by God. True worship comes from a heart that has been touched by God. Something we all need to work desperately to understand this morning, don't we? But see, this is where we all fall short, isn't it? If we're honest... It's hard to walk around all the time feeling like we should be thankful to God, right? We've had some hard weeks this week. We've had some long weeks. Things didn't work out like you wanted them to. And it's hard to walk in a position that says, let me reflect back to God why he's good. It's hard to do that. And we need to learn today and early on here in Luke, right in the beginning, and it'll help us understand when Jesus starts speaking and preaching himself, we could not crawl out of to a position that puts us in the same standing as Christ himself. In Romans 8, 17, Paul, in his description of the church to his people in the church of Rome, he says, and if as children, he's telling them, if, if this is how you are to relate to God, he says, then heirs, heirs of God, his children and fellow heirs with Christ, a family provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. As servants, we suffer but not as he did, but as we stand behind him in his name, still drawing from the strength of his example to emulate him in the world. We are provided a way by the gospel, a way to attain a status of righteousness, to be worthy of God, not by our doing, but by Christ, to be glorified, elevated to a standing we don't deserve. Listen, let me explain it to you this way. When I was a kid... My dad taught me how to do what he does. Some of you have seen my electrical skills are not worthy of my father, although the lights haven't blown out yet, Glenn. So I'm still, I'm still kind of good, right? But he taught me to do what he does. Do you know what he did well? My dad was a problem solver. He knew a little bit about everything, enough to get him in trouble, but he taught me never to quit on things, right? And so this is what he did for me. And through all those trials, let me tell you something. I had, a, I had some suffering. My dad suffered from PTSD for many, many years, and I saw the lowest parts of that man, but I endured. I also saw some of his good parts, and I endured. I also was underneath some of his discipline, and I endured. I suffered. I went behind him, and when he died, he left me a little bit of money, his truck, and his tools. 
Do you know why? So I could carry on his work. And do you know what his work was? Jody, I did the best I could. But make sure you always keep your word with another man. The, the name of May has integrity built into it. And do what you can. And he left me all that he has so I could do that. Now, in that, what I got from him was given. Not because I worked for it. Dad didn't give me those things because he owed me pay. Do you know why he did it? It was grace. I didn't deserve his things. You know why? He earned those things in his life. All that he had, he had earned. And in turn, had given me those things by grace so that I could use them to keep on the legacy. And this, my family here, listen to me, is how our God elevates us as well. We are lowly like Mary this morning. Nobody in here has a spiritual stance to stand up to God or compare anything to anybody else. We have nothing of value to offer God, but he bequeaths all that Jesus earned so that we may continue to bring glory to his name. Do you understand that this morning? Which, by the way, daddies and mommies in here, is the only way to build your family home. I want to give a special shout to my parents this morning. If you want to leave a lasting legacy for your kids that means something, stop spending so much time trying to make yourself better or build your name, but spend time trying to make much of God and watch him bless your whole family. It will work. So next, Mary praises God out of her changed heart. So we see here so far that, that out of this heart is coming praise. Praise that is offered to God and he's accepting it. Now in this part right here, she sees all the objectifiable, discernible work of God and what he does in this world. And this is the third reason this morning is that God is always mighty to save. She notices that her God has always enough to do what he needs to do. I said it this way in your notes this morning, that God's gospel of grace is always displayed by the testimony of his might to bring us joy. This next part of Mary's song shows that she did, not, she did do some reading in the Psalms because she actually structured it like them. If you looked at some of the structure of the Psalms, she spends the bulk of her hymn here describing God's power and his judgment. Both are to be feared and both are to be awed, by the way. Not just his grace, but his power. First, see how she takes notice that the same mighty God that did good things for her also does things for others like her. Verse 49, for he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And then she says in verse 50, and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. Others like me. Verse 52, exalted those of humble estate, just like me. And 53, he has filled the hungry with good things. God gives mercy to those that fear, and exalts those that are humble, and fills those hungry with the things that satisfy. That's good news, right? Just like Mary, he, she says that he does this for all his people. And second, also observe that she understands that in order to do that, God must overcome the world. It's not a free ride. He must have the power to do it. So she says in verse 51, he has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. So this little 13-year-old girl is noticing that. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones. And the rich he has sent away empty. This woman living in the oppression of the Roman government. So God chose, and she notices this, to cast out his judgment on the proud, the self-perceived rulers, and the rich that were not for his people. So God has both the power to tear down and build up according to what he wants to do, she notices. That should help you today, because no matter what you've gone through, or no matter what our government looks like, understand it's by God's will. is to do what he wants to do. Don't get lost in the wash she praises him for that because she sees a God, and this is what we are to be thankful for this morning, that gets his hand dirty for his people. He comes down from the elevation of king of the universe, and it gets involved in our lives with us while still controlling everything. He cares about us like that. Our God is mighty to save and does it without breaking a sweat. This is why we praise him. This is your God. Mary sees not just what the gospel does for her, but she sees the big picture of how God works in the world. And that's something we need to strive for. My family, don't get caught up in just your life every day and how God's doing something for me. Please understand, this God is working all things to bring it to a completion and uniting them in Christ. Watch a little bit of the news. Find out about foreign mission work. See how God is moving all things so that your heart may continue to develop a heart for praise. 
that we may praise God rightly because he's not just saving you, he's saving everybody. He's working this work for us. And that brings us to our fourth reason and our last reason for praise this morning. Then we're done. Is that God always delivers on a promise. Someone say amen to that, right? I'm thankful for that one, aren't you? Because I even got to close out the, the time of the memorial yesterday just giving people a word of praise from Thessalonians about how the dead shall rise to meet Christ in the air one day. That's a promise. We can bank it. God's gospel of grace must be given to those that he's promised it to, or else he can't be God. God can't break a promise. We praise him for that. She says here in the end of her song, He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. I think she's alluding to Jeremiah 31, but I can't prove that. But Mary is able to see. Here's third, this astounds me, guys, because this is why you have to know Scripture. She is able to see and look back over her, her nation's history over the centuries that God really does keep his covenantal promises. Look, she is living proof of that. Her virgin conception of the Messiah is the summation of all the Old Testaments for her people. Look, this girl is carrying in her stomach right now, and she realizes it, that from the beginning in Genesis, that when it was prophecy was given that the, 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 excuse me, that the child from Eve would one day crush the serpent's head, from that covenant promise given to when Abraham says you're told and your offspring will be like the stars of the sky, right? Or the, the sands of the seashore, right? And I'll give you land to have one day. So you bring that up to Moses and God gives him the law. And if you keep the law, I will be your God and you will be my people. And he gives the Mosaic covenant all the way to David and the kings. And he says, like, David, you're always going to have an heir on a throne. And in that moment, guess what Mary's heart does? She's exploding, I would imagine, because in her belly, she carries all of that. That's crazy. That'll make your head blow up. She's holding that there, and from that is changing your heart, and she's giving God praise, and she's realizing it. And what she's understanding, what God is driving home to her in that moment is that I keep my promises, and he keeps them for you, church. Listen to me. Mary had Old Testament covenantal promises. Do you know what you have right now? You have all of it, and you have the New Testament, the summation of all of it, and in that, it's a living God's, it's God's word living so that it all is a promise for you. God wants you to know he will always keep his word for you because if he states it in here, in the New Testament, understand me, he can't break that. He can't walk away from it. He can't say it doesn't count anymore because those days are over. He has to keep doing it because he's God. And he knows that if he wants praise to come from you that's worthy for him, he has to keep doing it. So that's God saving you, not you. Trust him. Put him to the test. In that, listen to all the things that come from the New Testament, guys. From now on, God, we are told in the New Testament that if you have been wrong, stop seeking vengeance. That is God's work. I will avenge you one day. Every knee will bow to my son. Let him do it. We're also promised, like I said in the book of this, a physical resurrection. Not just spirit. One day you'll have no more hurt in your body. You'll get a new one. It's a promise. Bank on it. To these rewards in heaven that were talked about in the New Testament. What does that even mean? I don't know what a crown is. I think it has something to do with responsibility and authority one day. I'll be anxious to see what that is, but we're promised it. I know it's coming. Remember, faith is about the assurance of the things we can't see, right? That's what we're believing in. We actually promised this big one, and oh man, how I know, Jared, how I know that one day we're promised no more tears. I don't even, when you're in the presence of a living God, it all burns away. That the glory of our Lord drives away our fear and our sadness. Can something be that good? I don't know, but it's promised to always have what we need to live right now. As, as Jesus taught us in the Gospels, don't worry about what's going to happen tomorrow. Don't worry about your clothes and all the food. Don't, don't I feed the birds of the air? You're going to have what you need. How often do we worry about our things? The Bible promises don't do that. And I will actually have, Jesus said, a Holy Spirit for all of life. I will send you the helper so you'll never be alone in this. That's a promise to this one, oh, that we need to hear this, to have a blessed assurance that will never be abandoned in our salvation. I will get you through, says God. 
to this last one. I remember Cole Spears in here today when we went and heard this a few years ago to the glorious promise of eternal life of which is not getting to be in heaven and walk on streets of gold, but it's finally to be united with Jesus in the flesh. Man, I'd sell everything for that. To finally see him, to touch a scar, to smell him, and maybe, just maybe, he'll breathe on me like he did the apostles. I'm going to get that. You're going to get that. It's a promise. And all of this is God's word to us. And we are to rejoice for all of it because it is true. Based on objectifiable things. Based on my friends and family, you've seen the Bible. It's been written. You've heard the accounts. And when we go through Luke and Acts, you're going to hear all the eyewitness accounts of it. And you've also seen 2,000 years of church history. You can't kill it. It is God's kingdom. You've seen it. Now believe it and offer him praise for it. So let me ask you a question, my family. Has your heart been filled yet today? Do you know why you praise him? Can you taste and see that your God is good? Then let's continue praising him this morning as a people in a corporate response to his goodness. Amen? Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this. Lord, we know that we as a people cannot offer you worthy praise without your help. And you saving us from a heart that tends not to hmm, accept those things. We are skeptical, skeptical people, Lord. We, have, um, we would rather believe the bad news that we see all the time in the world to understand that you're making all things new. Father, we can't survive unless you make us believe it. Lord, right now, some of my friends, many of my friends in here are believing. They're seeing it. Some of them are seeing it for the first time. God, I hope in the days ahead that all of us are like Mary, and we can respond with a song from a heart that's been changed by you, that we can give you praise. Lord, help us right now, dear Lord, as we just finish out our morning in a time of communion, in a time of offering and singing, Lord. And then as we leave, to continue worshiping you by bringing you glory in all that we do today, Lord, that it would be acceptable to you, pleasing to you, a pleasing aroma, God, our lives for you. We love you, and we praise in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen.